Turn it over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. And I'll like to go ahead and call this meeting to order. I think it's approximately about 534. It looks like we're going to have a full agenda. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, also, just to let you know about public comments, uh, what will happen is after calling to order, I will uh, submit the minutes for approval. And then after that time will be public comment, general public comment. And at that time, you will have three minutes per person. And uh, as a general practice, action will not be taken on the comments presented during that time. So, um, but uh, just to give you a heads up, I'll go ahead and get us started. And looks like we have the minutes for approval. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and read something to let everyone oh, yeah. know. Go ahead. Okay. Good evening, I'm Roger Steinbrock, the marketing supervisor for Lawrence Parks and Recreation. I have a few housekeeping uh, things to mention about the Zoom meeting. This meeting is being recorded and broadcast on the city's YouTube channel and on cable channel number 25. Please remember to mute yourself during the meeting unless you are speaking. Unless you're participating during the meeting, please turn off your video. This allows the active meeting participants to be seen on screen. You will still be able to hear the meeting when you are participating, please turn on your video. And if you have trouble, you can send me a chat in the box. It will go directly to me. Um, and then uh, we can get you resolved. Please remember to state your name each time you speak for the benefit of those participating remotely. The city reserves the right to mute people or turn individuals' videos off to minimize distractions during the meeting. And now I'll turn it back over to the chairperson, uh, chairperson Little John. Thank you, Bart. Thank you, Roger. Um, and uh, now I'll go ahead and move us on to the minutes. Uh, I believe you should have access to the minutes from the July 12th meeting, but if you haven't gone ahead and review, reviewed them, if you could do so now, that would be great. Thank you. Bart, this is Marilyn Hull, board member. I would like to move approval of the minutes as presented. Okay, there's Marilyn Hull uh, with the approval. Is there a second out there? This is Pat Phillips. Um, Pat Renault, I second. I second. Oh, sorry, Pat. That's all right, Pat. Uh, Pat Phillips with the second. Uh, and Given that there's a second, is there any additional comments or any questions regarding it? Seeing, I'm not seeing any. All right, I will just, I will just uh, do a roll call vote. Um, all those in favor, please just raise your hand in the affirmative. Any opposed, raise your hand now. Seeing none opposed, the minutes are approved. All right, thank you guys. All right, and now I'll go ahead and move us on to uh, public comment. Uh, 
Roger, I believe we have quite a few folks here for public comment. Is that correct? Well, I'm not sure. I think they may be speaking to an item that's on the agenda. Okay. So we might want to clarify that. Okay. If you're not speaking to something that's on the agenda already that you have some comment to make, uh, please let us know. There is somebody here live that is has public comment. And that's well. general public comment? Yes, general public comment. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> you could go ahead and uh, just... Let I'll have speak. him speak first, if that's all right, Mark. That sounds good. Okay. All right. Hello, my name is Eric Hyde. I'm sure a lot of you guys know about me, um, but you don't really know about me. Um, I've been cleaning up the uh, nascent park for, I'm on seven weeks right now. Um, you guys are an advisory board. Um, I don't know what you guys do. Um, but I know that people in the city don't give me any credit for the things that I've done. Um, for instance, uh, the homeless problem in Naismith Park, I was adamantly against it. Um, and then what happened, the city came in and cleared it out. Um, there was also some homeless problems against the river, by the bridge, in that open space, by the gravel road. I went there and talked to those homeless people, and they assaulted me with an aluminum bat. And they're not there anymore. Nobody gave me credit for that. Um, there is a guy working on Naismith Park right now who's, who's doing good. Um, but I think what I'm here to say is that I've been doing this work on Naismith Park. I've lived near Naismith Park most of my life. And I'm not going to go accusing anybody of anything, but the city, whoever it is, we don't need a name call here, but I will say the city, whoever that is, um, has not been taking care of the park for most of my life. Um, Oh, one thing that I want to say is um, I think you guys need to add a bridge. You guys took out a bridge when I was growing up because you didn't take care of the area. It overgrew, and now people can't go on the, the north, the north um, east side of Naismith Park where the neighborhood walks around there on that northeast side of the creek. I think there should be just a, a little bridge there. It would be awesome because people could enjoy it um, like they did before the city annexed it or whatever. Um, oh, I want to say that um, the guy who's taking care of the park, I told him that a lot of people look, look at me real funny, like I'm doing something wrong. And he said, just tell him you're a volunteer. And now that's what he said. I'm not a volunteer. I'm cleaning up the park. I'm not a volunteer. I do it because. Um, Eric, uh, just to let you know, uh, you're running up on the three minutes there. Yeah, I can talk as long as I want to, sir. Um, I'll, I'll be respectful though. Um, you guys do this three minute thing all the time. Don't do it anymore. Just listen to people. Uh, I don't have anything else to say, um, but I think you guys maybe should pay me or hire me. I'm not gonna apply. You're gonna have to call me. I'm not gonna interview with you. If you wanna hire me to take care of the park like I've been doing for seven weeks and before that for years, just a little bit here and there throughout the years, uh, you can. I love that park and I will take great care, but I already have, you can drive through it it's a great, I, you can see how much work I've done. The only work that the man does for it right now is mowing, trimming down those trees where the homeless camps were. Um, now he's gonna go back there in October and do it again. And uh, I mean, I'm doing everything else that the city's not doing. I think you guys should have, but that's it, thank you. Um, enjoy the rest of your meeting. So.
Thank you for that comment. Appreciate it. All right. Um, Roger, and the, there was no further uh, general public comment. Is that correct? That I know of, unless there's somebody in. And, and, and to clarify, like Roger said, this is not pertaining to any, uh, any one agenda item. This is general comment this period. Okay, somebody does have, okay. I see that somebody is asking, hoping to talk about the safety on the bike trails. Uh, All right, I uh, believe this is, is that Jim Knight? Okay. Right. All right, Jim. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Go okay. ahead. Um, uh, first off, I'm uh, very excited about the possibility of the loop being finished and uh, grateful for the trails. Um, but on uh, July 4th, I was biking behind Rock Chalk Park and I hit a it hadn't rained since I'd have to check the weather, but I think it, I think it rained on July 2nd and there was a, a bunch of water on the trail and my wheels went out uh, from my bike and um, wasn't going particularly fast. But uh, when I fell, I broke my acetabulum, my ilium, which is my hip and my pelvis. Basically, I ended up uh, had to be taken to Kansas City for surgery, I stayed there for a week, then two more weeks in. Uh, um, the Kansas City in Lawrence rehab, and um, uh, I'm only just now starting to put weight on my foot. I've got a wheel I'm sitting. I'm talking to you from a wheelchair. I wasn't able to work for a long period of time in the way I ordinarily would work because of my injury. I was in the hospital for three weeks. My surgeon told me that about 15% of the people who have a fall like mine, and I wasn't going especially fast. I was just riding on the trail. I actually take that trail pretty slowly because there's so many pedestrians, and um. He said 15% of them die from the, from the uh, fall like that because it ruptures your insides. Um, at any rate, um, there will be more people. When the EMT guys picked me up too, they said, oh, we've been back here before, suggesting that they'd picked other people up. And um, I forget who I talked to at Parks, but they sent me a picture of the trail to say, can you identify where you fell? And I sent back my uh, Strava thing so you could see exactly where I fell, but you could see on the picture that was sent back water on the trail where I fell. Now, um, my son-in-law, um, who works at the University of Washington, his wife's parents are uh, attorneys, and they both said, this is an open and shut case. If I was to sue the city, there's no doubt that I would win a liability case uh, because I was riding on a bicycle trail, designated as a bicycle trail, riding cautiously and um, fell in a way that, for, as they said, a large, well, it's, I don't know if I'll ever run again. And I was training for the Boston Marathon. So um, I'm not going to do that <clears throat> unless people are really nasty. To me. <laughs> it's not my intent at all, but somebody else might not be that way. And what's more, somebody, other people will fall there because as I laid there, called my wife and the EMT guys came and saw me. I could see people just trying to walk on the part that I rode on and they could barely like two or three people just about fell just walking on the path. And as the trail gets more and more popular, there'll be more and more people on that trail. So um, I have no idea how these things work out. I don't know the engineering of it, but as it stands right now, the issue there wasn't that there was water on the trail. What happened is the water laid on the trail and it got uh, lichen or something. It was really slippery. And, um, and I've talked to since then, one of the surgeons in the hospital told me about falling on the trail. Somebody else told me they broke their collarbone. And there's also the trail on the other side of the city, out by Clinton Lake, where there's water on that trail. But that one, I don't think is dangerous. I, I think you can get through that water without falling. The trouble is Rock Chalk Park where the trees are there and the water doesn't go off it. And as it lays there, it gets slipperier. So uh, I just wanted to say, um, I mean, I'm getting better and uh, I'm hoping that I'll get back to 100%. It's not certain that I will, but um, it could be worse. And even if it stays the same, it's not a good thing to have a, because people you don't want people riding on the roads because people are texting. That's not safe either. I was on the bicycle trail because I felt that was a safe place to be. So all to say, um, I just wanted to make sure you understand the, the seriousness of the situation, that it liter literally could have been my life. And uh, there are going to be more people on the trail, especially once the loop is completed. 
And so something has to be done to drain that area better so that it's a, a safer place to ride. When I fell, I cracked my helmet and it hit the ground and the ground was like spongy wet. So it had been a couple of days since the rain and it's still really, really wet in there. So I don't know how to engineer it or, or what, but I wanted to make you aware of the situation. I'm happy to talk with you if there's anything I can do to tell you more about it and uh, I urge you to act as, as quickly as, as you can find a way to fund it. I know that's probably got to be the issue, but it, it's, 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 it's going to be an issue that's going to get worse, I think. Uh, thank you for that comment, Jim. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, it's, uh, and uh, just, we really appreciate the uh, the information you provided there. I'm sorry to kind of cut you off, but- uh, That's okay, you didn't cut me yeah. off, it's fine. Yeah, I'm yeah, done. yeah. Okay. Um, I believe Steve Lane uh, has a comment as well, general comment, if you would go ahead, Steve. You bet, thank you very much. Thank you for this time. So on a related topic, I was visiting with uh, other people about the, Lawrence Loop, which is a fantastic bike path. And I happen to have been the coordinator for the Lawrence Community Bike Ride for the last decade and have had a variety of experiences on the community bike with that community bike ride with the um, kind of danger zones that the last gentleman was just speaking about. And I wanted to be able to comment on this tonight as well to bring it up as an issue for um, your group's, uh, I guess, added attention. And my specific experiences with the trail really relate back to the fact that our community bike ride largely is branded around families and kids. And we are always going out before that bike ride the night before and kind of checking the path because of these spaces that can be really slick. I've always called them slime zones. Uh, they just are like, like black ice almost, how slippery they are. And um, I, I've, we've had a few of our members slip on those on their bikes as well. They'll be out riding on them and they think it just looks like harmless water and then they hit it and the bikes just zip out from under them. Uh, anyway, I, I was, I was uh, motivated to contact you guys because of having a friend that fell on that as well. And I thought, gosh, you know, every year we have our community bike ride. I'm nervous about the kids going out there and hitting those and falling down. Um, so anyway, long story short is that I hope it can be a focus is that the places where there's the drain off that runs over the paths that it's uh, you can see the stain marks. So it's not like it's 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 kind of been uh, it's a known issue from just the stains that are left behind. Um, I know we're closer in the main thing I was thinking about was the area closer to the Rotary Arboretum. Uh, is the area that's on the downhill slope also toward the youth sports complex. Um, the soccer fields. Um, that's where I've seen it the most, but the one that the last gentleman talked about behind Rock Chalk Park is another great example. We have a really great facility at the Lawrence Loop. I would want to have it be a place that's considered safe. People are willing to help fundraise for this if you need the money. I think it's a matter of just getting it done. I'd love to see it prioritized within the next tw uh, 12 months and get it fixed so it's just not anyone else getting hurt like the last gentleman talked about. That's all I had to say. Thank you very much for this time. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Um, and Roger, uh, just to clarify, would we have any, if the board wanted to comment, would it be now or would it be like uh, in, in general board commenting time? It would be in general board comment. That's what I thought. And I sent you a note, there is somebody else with some public comment on uh, fees at the product centers. Harrison. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Harrison, sorry about that. Uh, if you would, uh, go ahead, the floor is yours. Hi, Bart Roger, thank you very much, I appreciate it. My name is Harrison Rosenthal. Um, I am with the board of directors of the Lawrence Masters Swim Club. Um, I came to the last meeting and uh, requested that you all solicit a report from uh, the aquatics folks asking about the fee structure and how they charge the different clubs, different fees. Um, and, and you did that. Um, and uh, Lori sent us that report this morning. So thank you very much um, on behalf of the board. We really appreciate that. Um, just a few uh, points of uh, clarification um, that, that I wanted to address um, and even if you don't address them now, I, I would appreciate you perhaps taking them down and maybe discussing them later. 
Um, I think that the first issue that we raised uh, as it pertains to the fee schedule was the justification for charging double at the outdoor pool, what the city charges at the indoor pool. So at the indoor pool, I believe it's uh, 775 per hour per lane and the outdoor pool uh, is 50, I'm sorry, is $15 and 50 cents per hour per lane. Um, and it seems to me based on the report um, that I received this morning, the only justification for that was the fact that there is twice as much yardage at the outdoor pool. And the only thing that I would reiterate to the board is that you know, the, the cost of operating a pool is fixed. It costs the same to employ a lifeguard or two lifeguards to watch over 25 yards worth of pool as it does to watch over uh, 50 yards worth of pool. So if you all would um, uh, take that comment, I would appreciate it. The, uh, the second comment that I would make um, pertains to, uh, oh, let's see here. Um, let me see. Oh, uh, and it also seems that Lori said part of the reason for the increase in price um, outside was that the board or the pool, the aquatics folks are considering this to be exclusive use for our swim club. So in the same way that private clubs like high school teams uh, who have meets will rent out the entire pool for $200, that seemed to be a piece of the city's or of the, um, the aquatics division's justification. And the only thing I would say to that is, you know, we, we really do not want exclusive use of the pool um, in the morning, right? Especially as it pertains to the outdoor pool, because we, we as a private club can afford to bear the cost of having an exclusive use of the pool. So if other people want to come and use the lanes when we're there, like we, we would encourage that so we don't have to pay as much. But ultimately, what's going on here is, um, number one, our, our club can't bear the financial burden. Um, but number two, with the per hour per lane fee structure, even if we're the only club using the pool, as is oftentimes the case, we are limited to those two or three or four lanes, even though the entire pool is open. Um, and it would be great if we could just go to a flat fee structure. Um, so with that, thank you all very much for entertaining the issue. Um, I think my colleague, Mark Baggert, who was also on the board of directors at uh, um, the swim club might want to say something, but if not, thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Harrison. Appreciate it. Uh, Mark, uh, did you want to ha have public comment at this time? Uh, thank you for recognizing me and thank you for taking uh, time to hear us out. Um, the only th other thing I may might mention is that it seems to be characteristic of the aquatic staff to always give us information at the last second. Uh, this morning we, re we received this uh, report and you know all of us are busy doing our jobs and, and um, we don't have time during the day to look it over. I applaud Harrison for getting with me <laughs> literally 15 minutes before this meeting and trying to uh, go through three pages of a uh, background history and, and put something together. But uh, I mean, even when we are asked to uh, submit our requests for what hours we want to swim or how many lanes we want, you know, we have a membership of quite a few, you know, 30, 40, 50 people, and they're asking us, they're giving us the request and then asking for the answer the next day. And, um, you know, we're not a swim club with a taskmaster who can tell all the swimmers, you're going to do what we say because we're the coach. We're, um, you know, a group of individuals, members, and we have to discuss it with all our membership. We just can't say, hey, you're going to do this because I don't have any time and I'm the guy making the decision. So that's a little bit of a side note. And then as Harrison was mentioning the exclusivity that uh, was raised, 
the history of masters in this city and it's documented in this background information that Lori gave us. You know, we started out some 20 years ago with uh, city board members that said, hey, we want to do something for the kids. You know, we want to do something for the adults that want to swim. We'll just give you the time at the outdoor pool because you want it at five in the morning and no one's you know, going to come do that. And so we just negotiated, we go in, we take care of it. And then obviously we had to start paying money for it and that was fine. But I don't think ever in any of those 20 years did anyone ever come up and say, you know, this is just gonna be exclusive for you. Because many times when we would set up the pool lanes, they would say, you know, we're gonna let some of the public in. So leave some lanes open for them. Or we're going to have the aerobics uh, people come do the diving well, things like that. And we said, that's fine. You know, we have no problem with scooting over or anything like that. So, you know, I just think more communication, more negotiation on, you know, just a one, one-on-one level. I don't even think we'd have to get the board yourselves involved. You know, if people would just sit and talk and negotiate a little bit. Um, that, that we wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, but again, thank you so much for listening to us. And uh, we'll hope you'll look over some of this stuff and, and get back to us. That's all I have. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. All right. And Roger, if I'm correct, it's would that with any of any opportunity that the board wanted to go ahead and comment would that be now or during the items of interest time well i will i would say during your time but if you want to change that you can it would just take a simple majority to change that to be able to speak to some of those things if you'd like okay does anyone uh does anyone want to speak of uh, speak to any of this right now or would it would you be fine with it at the items uh, in your particular item of interest during your time then? Okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and leave it then. All right, um, to go ahead and move us on to the agenda items. And I also want you to thank everyone that gave public comment today, uh, general public comment that really helps us out. Um, you are our ears to the ground and uh, it helps us figure out exactly what we don't know. So thank you. Um, that being said, moving on to agenda items, looks like our first one up is unmistakable identity, uh, strategic plan update. Okay. I'm Derek Rogers, director of Parks Recreation. Just wanted to provide a quick update. And it's kind of like, Telling somebody about Parks and Recreation, our strategic plan is big, um, but it's exciting. Our outcome is unmistakable identity. <clears throat> We're now in the process getting to the point that it's fun for the, the membership. Um, as part of the budget, you may have noticed you really didn't find Parks and Rec or any other departments really easy to identify in the budget process. Part of that is the unmistakable identity in our budget was approximately $21 million. Our budget was around 15, um, 6 million included the library and some Lawrence Art Center pieces of that. Um, the unmistakable identity is a lot larger than just parks and recreation. Um, and so now with the group, we meet monthly um, and discuss the strategies and how, what activities we can do to increase um, our unmistakable identity. And so I, I just wanted to share um, some of the strategies and the progress indicators real quick and kind of walk through that. And then the question I would have for the board, as part of our um, accreditation process, we've already got a master plan. We do need a strategic plan. One option would be to adopt the strategic plan of the city. A different option would be to take the city's strategic plan and tailor it through subcommittees to a parks and rec strategic plan. So 
let me walk through some of this and we can have those discussions probably at another meeting, but uh, something to think about. Uh, share screen, there we go. Okay, uh, I'll ask Bart to give me a thumbs up. Can you see something on the screen? Okay, great. Um, the, the first part of our unmistakable identity is community engagement. And so our first strategy we look at is marketing Lawrence as an event destination for parks, recreation, community, and cultural events. The progress indicators we use are percent of residents who are satisfied or very satisfied with the parks and recreation system. And then the second one is percent of residents who are satisfied, very satisfied amount of arts, diverse culture, and events. Um, the first one is a survey that the city puts out I think it's supposed to go out annually. I can't remember if they did one last year. Um, on that indicator, I believe the city of Lawrence came in around 84%. National average was 59%. The Kansas City Metro Parks and Recreation were about 75%. Again, I, we're still working on the strategies, but I mainly, or the activities, but I mainly wanted to run through some of the strategies and the progress indicators. Enhanced parks, parks amenities, rec opportunities to meet the needs of a growing city. Again, it goes back to the percent of residents satisfied. Um, invest in green infrastructure to provide attractive entrances to the city, sustainable urban forest, and inviting downtown business district. The progress indicators percent of residents satisfied, number of trees planted, removed, and maintained to create a healthy tree canopy. Uh, if you've been following our horticultural department, we've had two, uh, two icons in the, in the Parks and Rec department, Crystal Miles and John McDonald, who just retired, 76 years of experience. Um, I'd equate Crystal to almost the, and John, the Johnny Appleseeds of the city with why we're so green and why there's so many trees. So it's pretty awesome that their uh, legacy in the Parks and Rec landscaping will live on for many years and uh, we're blessed to have uh, that in our city. Um, efficient and effective processes strengthen the network linking cultural organizations and events to increase resident awareness and participation in cultural opportunities. Um, for our group, this is, this is uh, something that is very uh, interesting yet challenging. And for our group, we have the Lawrence Arts Center, uh, Library, uh, Watkins Museum, Theater Lawrence, uh, Explore Lawrence. Uh, many organizations are, are part of this as we look into our numbers. A, a example, we're still tallying visits and annual uh, year of visits to our facilities. And this includes all the following that are on that you see in the progress indicator, I come up with the count about 1.4 million visits. And so then we'll put a target, for example, do we wanna increase that number by 2%? Um, and again, how do we measure that? Uh, for Parks and Recreation, the key fob is gonna help us measure um, visits to a facility. Watkins is very good at that. The Art Center is very good at that. Theater Lawrence is very good at, at measuring those uh, items. Um, we talked about some of the activities, centralized calendar, um, daisy chaining events. So people want to come to Lawrence, stay here. Um, if you can get a, a few little events with the big event, then maybe we actually generate hotel sales and more people come to Lawrence for our cultural identity. This one is, I, I also really enjoy. It's equity and inclusion, develop and support it initiatives that engage underserved and underrepresented communities. The percent progress indicators, percent of the black, indigenous, and people of color residents rating this community is welcoming. Second one is percent of residents who believe their culture is celebrated in the community through festivals, parades, etc. And then percent of scholarship that meet that is met for recreational programs. You know, one of the things that uh, after we can get the new assistant director for recreation um, hired, and we'll also have a couple uh, marketing event specialists to help with this unmistakable identity, is um, one of the things we discussed is the need for um, more scholarships, not just for, for youth, but a scholarship for all ages. 
Um, so how do you do that? It might be somebody with uh, middle income that um, is in the, the lower end of the economy yet would like to play softball, things like that, or somebody that's a senior on a fixed income. And I think we can do that. Um, the city managers talked about this and I know MSO started some of it. Uh, it may mean we increase fees a little bit, but we also provide a scholarship opportunity for all ages, all populations in the city of Lawrence. On another note, if you've been paying attention to some of the city commission meetings, um, one of the individuals that speaks is uh, calling out the city, in particular the part-time um, employment and the uh, living minimum wage, uh, living wage. Um, something we're working on, uh, we won't have it fixed really quick, but we are looking and working to raise the part-time wages. The uh, living wage in Lawrence, the last number I saw was around $13.74 an hour. Um, some of the discussion items we have is if you're a, a high school kid and it's your first job, do you need a living wage or you just need a job versus somebody that's a part-timer year over year that's uh, serving the city and the community that really does need a, a living wage um, as a part-time individual. And we talked about sound fiscal stewardship. Um, you know, the net cost per visitor attending the event, we have some great discussions with, okay, I host the Busker Fest. What did it cost the city, really? Well, I'm sure the city's involved in some part of that. It may be with fire, it may be medical, it may be uh, MSO. Um, probably not the best indicator. Um, as we go forward, we'll look at maybe better measures. Another one that comes up, retail sales downtown Lawrence. Um, I was looking at the 2018 report for Lawrence, and I found it interesting. If you look at sales tax, downtown Lawrence generated 8.7% of the, the sales tax. South Iowa Street came in at like 42%. Uh, Six and Walker Russo was like at 9.5 or 9.7%. So the key is we want our, our, um, our unique downtown. At the same point, we don't want to see sales anywhere in Lawrence decrease. All areas of Lawrence have their own identity and it's worth promoting. Um, so that, that's kind of a tricky subject. Um, but it is something we have discussions on and um, I've had some pretty good ones with the uh, unmistakable identity group. And it was just some of the things we kind of kicked around. You know, if you think about a vibrant downtown, one of the things that you know, we think about is if you see a high vacancy rate, um, or you see a lot of empty buildings downtown, that makes you not feel that's very vibrant. If it's a turnover, that's another thing. Lawrence obviously has, I think, high retail rent downtown, and that makes it difficult for some businesses to stay. Uh, some of the ideas that kicked around were some different days and ways that we can attract more business incubators. Um, programs, pop-up pop shops. On the city, um, engaged empowered teams. These are progress indicators uh, that apply to all um, outcomes of the city. And so we've been working on quite a few things there. You know, one of the things that uh, we were looking at is we've got funds donated to the community for recreation for kids. Could a portion of that be utilized every year to have a free event for recreation for the kids in the community? So why not give something back partner with multiple organizations and give back to the community for an event or two every year. Environmental sustainability. Um, you know, I have some hopes that uh, you know, there will be opportunity to acquire more property for sound fiscal, for sound uh, environmental stewardship of the properties and provide opportunities in the future whether it may just be for a natural area of the walk and view or for actual amenities that may be bike trails. I will stop sharing at this point and just ask, are there any general questions or discussion about uh, an update on unmistakable identity?
this is John Nalbandian, board member. Uh, Derek, can you remind us uh, where the unmistakable identity um, activities, themes, whatever, um, connects to the city's strategic plan? Unmistakable identity is one of the five outcome areas and okay. six commitments that go along with that. So each commitment area drives it. And so you're going to find in every outcome, there's probably going to be conflict. So if we say sound fiscal stewardship, it may conflict with building or adding amenities. Um, say, um, if there's buildings in a floodplain floodway the city is no longer using and we need to restore that area back to its natural condition, you know, what's the cost of doing that? So if you'd like, I can pull up the strategic plan and, and show that a little deeper. No, I think it I might help. No, I'm, oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, John. I didn't mean to say no, no, that's good. That's good. That's good yeah. there. I don't know who pulled that up, but thank you. Is that Roger? <laughs> awesome. So Good these luck. are the outcomes that are associated with the strategic plan itself, right? Derek Rogers Parks and Recreation, that is correct. And Parks and Recreation is tied and the champion for unmistakable identity. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. So we could take the strategic plan and tailor it, or we could adopt it as part of our accreditation and just knowing that, that we're, we have ownership in the unmistakable identity. This is Val Renault, board member. Derek, Derek, would you say that again? Parks and Rec is tagged or responsible for the unmistakable identity? Yeah, Derek Rogers, Director for Parks and Recreation. Each one of these outcome areas has a champion. and it, A champion, okay. It's, it's tied to department. And Parks and Recreation uh -huh. is the majority of the budget of unmistakable identity. Um, okay. And that's what made, I think, we're still using priority-based budgeting. We're still funded basically like we were, but this is where I think we're trans, transitioning to. And so as we tie to that unmistakable identity, it, I think as the community goes, so does Parks and Recreation. Uh, this um, is John. This John okay, can I make one more comment while I'm on? Uh, and it's, oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's a detail, but on, and it ties into the diversity that we'll talk about later. Um, in addition to black and indigenous and people of color, could you add people with disabilities? as part of diversity and there may be others you know elders or but they are definitely part of diversity i think and then, thank you yeah. uh, this is john nalbandian again uh derek i think one of the things uh that uh one of the aspects of this that uh, stands out for me of the unmistakable identity is uh, the connections that um, you are either making explicitly or implicitly with other uh, community uh, uh, community entities. And I think, um, uh, you know, looking at the broadest themes of what's going on in municipal, governance these days, the idea of uh, network leadership is becoming a very important uh, aspect of, um, of strategic planning. So that if we actually understand that while um, Parks and Rec may be the driving or the responsible party here, unmistakable identity. What you're doing is reaching out to the arts center, to the library. In terms of accreditation, I think that would be very attractive. Derek Rogers, Director of Parks and Recreation, you hit the hammer, you hit the nail right on the head with the hammer. Uh, 
in a lot of ways, the beauty of networking and partnerships and collaborations is Parks and Rec doesn't have to do all the work. We may put the pieces together um, and it, yeah, it's working with KU um, on their KU homecoming, which this year I believe is going to be on their campus, but it's just talking with them and saying, hey, you know, you could expand this if you do something here and here's some partners that would be really easy and, and make this thing big and add to our identity. So yeah, you're, you're spot on with what we'd like to see. <clears throat> Excuse me, Derek, this is John Blazik, advisory board member. You know, I enjoy looking at all this data. This is really cool. And I've been here nine years, but you had something about the taxes on the South end and the North end. I mean, I would hope the city leaders, and I don't know if they've not talked to any business owners down there. There's a reason why downtown is dying. I mean, A, the parking, B, it's absolutely filthy down there. And three, it's not safe. We don't go down there anymore. We go south. And I would think the city leaders would have to give the business people an owner or an opportunity to go out and talk how they've lost parking due to the outdoor eating, which I think is good, a good idea. But wow, it's just people are just dying down there. That's why you have so many vacancies. So I would think that political leaders of this community would not just shove this under the rug because I hear so many people and I'm one of them. I don't go there anymore because of those three reasons. So, but I do like the data and I hope they try to revitalize downtown because it's sure not what it used to be five years ago. And Derek Roger, director of parks and recreation. I, I would say in the last four months, I, months, I spend a lot more time downtown in the evenings and just walking the streets. And my perspective is probably a little different. We'll all have different perspectives on feelings of safety. Um, but I, I find it interesting to see who's downtown and, and who's partaking. And I, I see a vibrant downtown and I, I see a lot of people out eating. I see a lot of people from out of town. I see, you know, walking across the street on the back parking lot of Vermont, almost getting run over and feeling like I'm in the plaza in Kansas City because it's not the Lawrence neighborly, hey, I'm a Lawrence resident. I came downtown to have dinner tonight. I see a lot of kids. Um, I see more vacancies between the 10 and 1100 block of mass, which has struggled the last few years. COVID probably got some of it. Um, but overall, I like what I see. Now, I went down for the first time to, to get my daughter from the sandbar. No questions asked. She called and said, Dad, can you give me a ride home? And so, yeah, 1130 at night, I've got a different feeling when I'm downtown. <laughs> but at a 7, 8, 9 o'clock, I... I, I'm not feeling too bad down there. And I, we do have our folks open out. The sidewalks went well. We blew the area down. There is always room for improvement, John. And I, and I agree. That's an area we need to work on. So. Uh, and this, this is John Blotz again. I think you just ought to give the decency to respect to the board or the uh, owners, business owners, a, a survey to ask them. Yeah. Get their thoughts because that's not what I see at all. So. Okay. I appreciate you approaching that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that comment. Does uh, anybody have any further comment regarding the strategic plan? Um, I have one. Derek, uh, is this just more of an update, you know, kind of thing, or do you need any input from us or just kind of just to keep us in the loop, which I'm hoping, you know, kind of thing? Is that what this is? That, that's what this was, was keep us okay. in the loop. Uh, if you have strong feelings, if you think this is something we would like to tailor as a group to drill down, I, I think it can be done for a Parks and Rec strategic plan. It's required for accreditation. We have a master plan and we need a strategic plan. I know other cities have accepted their city strategic plan as their own, and that will meet the requirement as part of our accreditation process. And maybe that's the best way of moving forward that we can keep the accreditation moving forward. Uh, Bart Little John Chair, advisory board again. Uh, where are we? How old is our master plan again? 2017, about four, almost five years now. Okay. Um, yeah, I think our last one went, Roger, how many was that? 17? I, ideally, 
no more than 10. Um, I would say park staff has done a phenomenal job, Mark, and of keeping things moving and plugging away and, and filling those squares. And it's probably about time for another master plan or getting it on the schedule. Okay. Yeah. So I, it's, I'm just trying to track, you know, it's like how strategic plan flows into that. You know, also, you know, the overall strategic strategic plan with our CIP and things of that sort. So, gotcha. All right. Um, does anybody uh, else have any further comment on this one? Okay, that's, that's all right. And was there any general? I'm sorry. Was there any public comment on this agenda item? All right. I'm not hearing any. Okay, Mark, I'm sorry, go ahead. Roger Steinbrock, marketing supervisor. Um, I, I didn't know if everyone had seen that plan, the strategic plan that I put up. I'll send you a link to that document if you'd like, so everybody can have it. Or has everybody Roger. seen that document already? I'm pretty sure it's been circulated uh, around us uh, okay. a bit, but I, myself, I don't remember too much of it. So you might submit again. <laughs> I'll put myself out there by saying it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, uh, I'll go ahead and move us on to our next agenda item, which is the discussion on a draft plan for uh, regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion um, and just uh, for everybody listening as well, uh, we'll just go ahead and have park staff give us the uh, update on it and then we'll comment and then we'll solicit some uh, public comment, if any. So, uh, Derek, did you want to do this or, I mean, did you want us to kind of contribute as members of the subcommittee with it or how did you want to work this? The Roger, Director of Parks Recreation, it, if the subcommittee could um, walk through it, that would be great. I know we're in transition in between Penny and Roger and. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I could go ahead. Uh, as being a part of the subcommittee, um, this is kind of, like I said before, this is a draft that we've worked on uh, in terms of tailoring and creating a uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion plan that would, uh, and what we try to do is follow along exactly what Derek was talking about in terms of the strategic plan as well. Um, so we want, uh, after getting to a good place with it and getting some good pieces in there, we wanted to go ahead and get it to you guys to go ahead and review. Um, but in, in, in an overall top level, like, you know, <laughs> overview kind of thing, ideally what we were thinking is uh, those first questions to consider would be things that initially park staff or us as an advisory board would think of uh, anytime we were presented with a new item or any sort of proposal that came by our way. Uh, namely, who does it benefit? Who is burdened? Are there inclusive? Is there inclusive representation? Is there access for all? And is there a welcoming space? And who is missing? Um, so a lot of those questions were actually, you know, uh, ones that John now Bandia put us on to uh, that, you know, other park staff and other parks department have been asking a lot of these similar questions and we thought it would be behoove us and be of benefit to go ahead and include that as well. Um, so after that initial stage of, okay, now we're going to digest it, the rest of the plan would be more of a deeper dive for the park staff into, into implementation and an actual um, strategy regarding it. So if you would, if you haven't had an opportunity, uh, go ahead and grab a look at it and just uh, let us know. And Derek, feel free to jump in with any, any points. I know that you probably weren't a part of the meeting too much, but uh, any points you want to add? And also, I'm sorry, others of the subcommittee, please feel free to jump in as well. Hey, Bart, this is John Blazik, board member. <clears throat> I read all that. And I, I, I think it's a great idea, but I have a couple questions. Now, I, I got lost. Is the 
city give them given in call valley the land or is it a city call valley is it cooperatively how's that going to be derek uh john john uh we're, yeah. we're, we're on the uh diverse i'm sorry diversity equity and inclusion plan right now that's oh, our next well no wonder i felt lost sorry <laughs> no that's all right that's i all thought right. you went i thought you went on to the call valley deal no no you jumped the gun a little bit so you're a good man brother thank you <laughs> all right <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Bart, this is this is Val Renault board member. Um, so this is addressing more the process. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's uh, basically, you know, the first part is a boilerplate, just kind of stating what the city thinks of, you know, and how they want to uh, make sure that, you know, diversity equity and inclusion is surrounding everything that they consider. And then, you know, kind of those initial questions and then a little bit of a formal definition of, you know, kind of the, the, the parts of equity that we we're looking at as well, like distributional equi equity, process equity, cross-generational equity that we want to make sure that, you know, is a part of the process as well. Um, but yeah, yeah. Okay. So I had one comment mm -hmm. from a resident and it may fit in here and it may be just way too specific, but she was saying that there isn't aerobic equipment for wheelchair users at uh, Holcomb and East Lawrence, but there are two uh, accessible aerobic units of, I think, bicycles or something at Rock Chalk Park. So that I guess that's a kind of question. Like I know that comes into budget too, but how do you, how do we make some of those decisions? You know, on that kind of access specifically. So I just wanted to throw that out from um, a constituent. Absolutely. I mean, that's kind of what this process would help with. You know, that initial question of like, all right, so we're going to purchase new equipment for Rock Chalk Park. Um, that would be a part of it because you know who benefits from it who is burdened, uh, your friend would be because there would be some equipment that she couldn't access. So, I mean, she would be left out of the process. You know, is there inclusive representation? There isn't. Um, is there access for all? There, it's looking like there, there's not. And is it a welcoming space? She probably wouldn't feel so. And then who is missing? Your friend. So th those, are, those initial questions surrounding just even that one particular item would really help us to kind of, you know, close those gaps and circle around it to make sure that we're providing a space that everybody feels welcome. Uh, Bart, this is Marilyn Hull, board member. Um, I wanna commend the sub subcommittee for laying some great groundwork. I, I maybe like Val, but in a more general way, I'm always interested in where the rubber meets the road and in knowing what what's going to be done differently because of this commitment? Um, is that something that's going to be outlined in the policy or is that for staff to um, keep in mind as decisions are being made? I mean, how, is, how do we, like, how do we know that this policy is actually going to be implemented and, and change the way things are done? That's a great question. Uh, it's one we brought up to Penny, and uh, because we're we're not going to do the heavy lifting with the advisory board. I mean, we, we take these under consideration for general, high level parts of the project, but the actual implementation of it is up to the Parks and Rec staff. So, Derek, yeah, Derek Rogers, Park uh, Parks and Recreation Director. A lot of that, you're right. It does lay on us, and you look at the uh, unmistakable identity. And what we've got there, a lot of it deals with uh, diversity and inclusion. Dr. Ferris Muhammad, our equity advisor, was also part of the committee that, that worked with the subcommittees on developing this. So, so yes, it, it, the onus is on all of us, not only for the city staff, but also on the board as projects come forward. To, are we looking through all the lenses or you know, do we have blinders on? And, I think it keeps us all honest. Um, this is Pat Phillips, board member. Um, there was kind of three layers to this, and I know Derek, you just spoke to one of them. Anything new programs, you know, to look through this lens and these questions for all these areas. 
that we talked about, um, you know, parks and recreation areas that are listed um, secondly, but also um, looking at the past policies, um, whether they're outdated and need to be changed. So that was another layer is, you know, taking time to go back and look at things that historically don't jive with what, you know, we're committed to doing today. So that was another level as well. <coughs> Jackie Backer, board member. Uh, I can kind of continue on, on what Pat was going with this. I think if you kind of move down to page two and you can really look at the review of services, programs, and policies, I think that's really where, you know, they start, Parks and Rec can start really looking at what they're doing, whether it was in the past or how we're moving forward in the future. And, you know, things like special events or things like in our last meeting where we learned Liz Ramirez was bilingual. And the fact that we currently don't have a bilingual person working at the front desk of Parks and Rec, well, that goes back to the questions then that really came forth, you know, at the beginning, who benefits, who is burdened, is this inclusive? And so I think it's really trying to place it into everything that Parks and Rec is doing. Uh, one thing that I, I did bring up um, that I think is really important when we're looking at DEI work uh, is the accessibility part that I think is really critical to Parks and Rec. And especially Val with what you just brought up with your friend and uh, something I read last week that again, we'd already met and had our meeting, but they're starting to call it IDEA instead of DEI and it's inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. And I think that is an even better word and language for our community to embrace that I think really puts it out there for Parks and Rec to really be challenged in everything that they're looking back on the past. And as they move forward, are we creating things that are accessible, equitable, and inclusive? for everything in our community related to Parks and Rec. And this is just the, you know, beginning of the process. You know, we're, we're, we're this is this the draft process. We just want to get in front of you guys so you can get a look at it. And we realized, um, also in talking with Dr. Muhammad, that, you know, this process is probably going to have to be deliberate and not, you know, not very fast moving because, you know, funny enough, people don't like change too much. So, um, you know, it's it, we might have to kind of make sure that we can all kind of move along with it. So, um, but I, I think this is a great start. Do we have any uh, further comment on the draft itself? Uh, in, in, and as well, you know, if you guys, some of you need to go ahead and sit with it and think more about it, just feel, please feel free to, like I said, this is just the, uh, the start of the process. Okay, all right. Well, uh, yeah, please feel free to go ahead and send us your feedback on that. Um, I'm on the subcommittee as well as Jackie and Pat. Um, so, um, yeah, and uh, I think Amber might join us later, but, uh, but yeah, and thank you for go ahead and uh, taking time to go ahead and review it. Uh, to go ahead Pardon? and get, I'm sorry, go ahead. Public comment on that. Oh, we have, we do. No, is there no, any no, public comment? For it, so oh, I, yeah, sorry. I don't know if there is any. Is there any public comment regarding this? Uh, thank you, Roger, for keeping me honest on that, uh, regarding this agenda item. Not seeing any. Are you Roger? Uh, I got something that's, oh, uh, it's more on the soccer. So, yes. Okay. Oh, we'll go ahead. okay. All right. All right. All right. Let's move us on to item, agenda item number three presentation, presentation of the city partnership for turf soccer fields. And as I said before, uh, we're going to go ahead and just have the presentation on that and then sort of uh, board comment, then public comment. I'm sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll do public comment first on that since it seems like we have a sizable amount and then uh, just do some board comment after that, so. Roger? Yes, I have a comment uh, that it's from Josh Woods. I don't think he's still on, he just jumped off. He said he wanted to share a few comments on the soccer turf for, uh, Sporting Call Valley plan. Uh, he's a board member of uh, Sporting Call Valley and also a parent of two female soccer players. 
He says he's in strong support of the city accepting the uh, Sporting Caw Valley, and I'm sorry, I, SKV is not one of those things that rolls off my tongue properly, uh, proposal to install two turf fields at the Clinton Lake Youth Softball or soft Sports Complex. Uh, those, uh, there are so many reasons to accept this proposal and most importantly, it aligns directly with LPRD's strategic plan that was discussed earlier. I would be curious to know if there has been ever a single community nonprofit that was requesting assistance to support their mission, where that same organization was willing to fully pay for the project over time. This is a no brainer financial investment for the city with 100% plus ROI. I am prime example of parents who had taken both of my girls to play full time for a Kansas City soccer club due to the lack of acceptable facilities and soccer surfaces in Lawrence. I'm committed to the Sporting uh, Caw Valley Board and will continue to work to attain the proper facilities in Lawrence. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for the public comment. And I think we've got the presentation coming from, I would assume, Tanya? Right, or, or is it coming from actual parts and records? Bart, I would just, Roger Steinbrock, Parking Supervisor, I would mention that you did receive public comment from someone today that emailed. Oh, we'll make yeah. that available after the meeting when we post okay. stuff. So that will be part of the information that's posted at that time. Yes, yes, uh, we did receive public comment after the time from, uh, I believe it was Tanya Cyber, president of. Uh, Sporting Paw Valley, and that will be available after the meeting, like Roger said. Um, uh, Derek, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly who's going to be making this presentation. Uh, and Derek Rogers, Director of Parks Recreation. It, I think you're going to see a tag team. Marcus probably doesn't know about this yet, but we're, we've got a couple documents, uh, one submitted by Sporting Call Valley. We've been working for many months with uh, Sporting Call Valley, a Mammoth Sports Construction. I, I see Lauren uh, Meyer on the on the phone call from Mama and some other board members, and so um, we got a lot of things to to go through. And um, Marcus, if you want to go first, that's great. If you want me to go first, just let me know. Um, I'd say why don't you go ahead and go first, Derek, and then I can go in after you. Okay, um, let me pull up. share my screen and, and pull up the, uh, the memo that we were looking at. See. I'll walk through this pretty quick. So as we discussed, you know, I think Sporting Call Valley and City of Lawrence both see a, uh, a benefit to the community on having artificial turf in Lawrence. And for our community members, uh, I know Sporting Call Valley um, in Lawrence is, uh, you know, they, they deal with rain outs, whereas artificial turf, they wouldn't have that. They'd be able to play longer, longer seasons, go longer. <coughs> And so when they do have rain outs or the weather, like last spring, we had a, a frost line that if they'd played on the grass, it would have sheared the, uh, the grass off the roots and turned into mud fields. So during that time that our fields were unplayable, they went to Topeka, Kansas City. So what we're proposing, um, went go by the board first, and then uh, city commissions recommend city managers propose 2022 capital improvement plan be included a parks and recreation project that would install artificial turf on two of the soccer fields at U sports complex at an anticipated cost $1.5 million. And then recommend in signing the contract build contract uh, with mammoth sports construction. Um, it's a green bush corporation. We have an agreement. We wouldn't have to, to bid that out. Again, over the last few months, we've been working with uh, Mammoth Sporting Call Valley and the city, Parks and Rec, to discuss the project, how can we move forward? 
The concept has moved forward with the idea that the revenue generated from the hourly rental fees, primarily from Sporting Call Valley and other interested community groups, would cover a substantial portion of the annual debt payment needed to construct the fields. A project of this type was envisioned as part of a larger, is envisioned still, a larger $3.2 million capital CIPM project, which is 2026, um, currently funded in our uh, CIP uh, budget that was just approved with our city budget. If the city were to move forward with the two soccer fields 2022 as a project uh, that is substantially funded by revenue, there's potential to reduce the tax support needed for the 2026 CIP. So we'd still get some turf in the future. It might be at uh, baseball infields and we'd have a, actually have a savings to the taxpayer by funding this project earlier. I think we all believe this project will greatly improve the quality and playability of local recreational youth leagues. We'll provide first-class competitive venues for advanced level soccer competitions. Artificial turf, again, increases the number of days and hours in a year that the fields will be available to the community um, due to the uh, less rain outs over natural grass and significantly reduce the need of the Lawrence residents to travel to other cities to train and play for similar, on similar artificial turfs throughout the year. It does tie to our unmistakable identity and our strategic plan, as was mentioned earlier. Um, how would we pay for this? The revenues that construct the fields comes in about 160,000 a year with interest. We do city debt. Uh, if the project were to be approved, the CIP amended, then there is a 60-day uh, wait period uh, where somebody could protest the project. I don't anticipate that would happen, and then. With core approval, um, the project could begin with groundbreaking. Um, so the cover of the project looks to be about $160,000 a year of revenues and sponsorships from Sporting Call Valley as a substantial user, roughly at 2,200 hours at $65 an hour and the sponsorship would pretty much get us there. When you think about parks and recreation budget though, um, and this is something we would have to work on as part of the department. Uh, currently, Sporting Call Valley uh, pays about 80,000 a year in revenue to rent the grass fields out at youth sports complex. So the revenues generated from Sporting Call Valley would now go to the debt payment and parks and recreation uh, will need to work on uh, covering uh, those revenues with other revenues um, as part of our, our budget. So, you know, we see an avenue to do that. I, I do think that, you know, we're behind the power curve. How do we do that? Other organizations that um, rent fields may have already be in contracts with other organizations. Um, the other thing, you know, is the supply and demand. Um, you know, Sporting Call Valley, we know is, is interested in 2,200 hours for 10 years at $65 an hour. Uh, and, you know, we really haven't rented um, that many fields over the years to other organizations relating to soccer um, because Sporting Club Valley has been the main user of, of YSC. The uh, projected lifespan of artificial turf is 10 to 12 years, depending on how it's used. Uh, maintenance is a little, a little less in maintaining them. Um, and then at the end of life, there will be a need for uh, replacing the, uh, the turf, which is usually at a, a substantial uh, decrease in cost than the original install price. And just kind of walk through some talking points. Uh, other user groups and individuals have got the fields, um, not only uh, on the hours not used by Sporting Call Valley, it would be available for the community, but also the grass fields would have more time for the community. Um, other organizations could be lacrosse, rugby. Uh, we have a lack of uh, baseball fields for rentals, so maybe some of that could be converted to uh, baseball backstop rentals. Obviously, some of the benefits of artificial turf, increased playability, not su subject to the weather rainouts, frozen ground, or needs to grow grass, uh, pesticide-free, 
can't say it's 100% free because there may be some spraying of weeds around the area. It does save water. Drawbacks of artificial turf, there are high initial costs. We talked about the lifespan. They tend to last 10 to 12 years. It may cost in a future CIP 600000 to a $1 million to replace that at the 10, 12 year mark. Higher surface temperatures during the summer than natural grass could be about 20 degrees higher in some instances. Um, Parks and Recreation did take this proposal uh, to the CIP committee um, and our CIP was just recently passed. Our current five-year CIP plan, which was just approved, was reviewed again by the city uh, CIP committee to look at reducing the 2026 CIP project by $1.5 million if this project were to be approved by the city commission. Um, the statement from the CIP committee, while the CIP committee didn't reject the idea, they did not feel they had the authority to approve the change either. This requires city commission approval to prioritize uh, one user group's project over others that have been submitted for funding. Uh, another option that the city has explored with uh, Sporting Call Valley uh, would be subleasing um, space out of YSC or at you know, YSC or core property. Uh, they could build their own artificial turf, two fields, uh, run that. Uh, additional considerations. A Corps of Engineers approval to start the project. We did, uh, Darren heard back today and he's on the call that can answer some questions. Um, discussed at the project level at the Corps, they've agreed that they could move forward with approval so long as the restoration clause is included. However, it would take many months before we can get an official approval to start. Uh, they wanted to know when the project could start or would start. Um, it basically would probably be a restoration clause uh, like this with Jack Model Masters. If for some reason at the end of life, you restore it back to the natural state that it was in prior to the construction. You know, and obviously one of the top goals of Parks and Recreation, health and wellness of our community members, organizations like Sporting Call Valley, Lawrence Youth Football, Lawrence Mountain Bike Club, Will provide opportunities to Lawrence residents and Parks and Rec. When they're provided by other organizations, Parks and Rec doesn't have to run or design a program. This results in a win for the community and for our department so we can focus our resources on other programs, increase opportunities for health and wellness of our community. With that, Marcus, are you ready? Sure, let's see here. Yes, I don't know how much to double cover. I don't know, um, uh, by the way, I'm Marcus Dudley, the Executive Director of Sporting Call Valley. Uh, I've been in that position for about 11 years now. So I've worked with multiple members of the uh, Parks and Rec uh, Department uh, over that time period. Um, did all of the advisory board members have an opportunity to read through the proposal that uh, we had shared? Okay, that's good because that gives a, a little more maybe context into how long we've been out at that complex. Obviously, it predates the involvement of, of uh, Parks and Recreation in the city. Um, that's been our home for almost 35 years. Uh, and we've been providing soccer now for almost 40 years uh, in the Lawrence community. Um, I know Derek had talked about this being a couple months uh, in, in discussions. For us, it's been closer to 18 months to two years. I know we had approached the Parks and Rec Department um, about looking for a possible partnership um, back then at that time uh, and sought approval to gain a geo um, survey, to do soil samples and to see what these costs would actually be to have 14 and 15, two of those fields that we're talking about converted over to turf at that time. Uh, that research and investment was done on our own behalf so that we could get a proper evaluation of how much it would cost to have two turf fields built. <clears throat> I will tell you that uh, of our competitive players, which we have uh, about 600 of them, none of them play games or practice uh, on turf. I'm sorry, none of them practice on turf and all of them play games on turf in Kansas City. 
So we do not have a single competitive player who is practicing on the same fields that they, that they, that they compete on. Um, and it certainly doesn't help prepare them for high school as well. So after kind of realizing that this is a major, a major need um, of, of our organization, something that our members um, have clearly articulated that we want, uh, that was the reason that we approached the city about looking for potential solutions to partner. <clears throat> and there's been a couple different solutions and Derek's mentioned them. One was to um, see if we could partner directly with the city. Uh, another was to move off site and to build our own facility, which we've had some, some more organ or we've had some individuals offer some potential land for that as well. Uh, and then we've talked about this kind of lease option of where a portion of the land at the core would be um, leased to us and then we would build. Um, both of those last two issues, the moving off site and or leasing the land to us, we felt were not the most ideal uh, in part because it doesn't solve your gap, you know, in terms of the $80,000 that you would lose uh, and or doesn't really um, create an opportunity for the city to, and the other members of the community to, to benefit uh, from that project. So <clears throat> with all of that in mind, um, we approached uh, Mammoth, who we've known uh, through a variety of different, uh, um, I guess, potential opportunities. Uh, and they gave us a bid. And at that time, the bid, I'll be honest with you, was much higher. And so we went back to the Parks and Recreation Department and said, what if we could make this part of a much bigger deal in terms of could we build in football, could we build in baseball, and would that bulk pricing be able to drive down the cost of all these things? And so Mammoth came back and gave us a, a proposal of all of those items. Um, and that's kind of where we see the price now. And Mammoth has been <clears throat> excellent about not increasing the price, even though all of the rest of that work would not be done at the same time. So in talking to, uh, uh, to the Parks and Rec Department, you know, we've really been looking about how could we fund this. And I think from our perspective, uh, our approach has been, um, could we take on the entire financial burden? Uh, we, as you saw, the, the, the proposal is 1.436 million, I think at a 1% interest rate, which I think Jeremy gave the information to uh, Parks and Rec, it would be about 1.57 million to complete the whole project. And after long discussions with our board, uh, we were willing to commit $1.6 million over 10 years to completely fund the project. With some caveats, obviously, that we have priority utilization, like we have at the complex for quite some time, that we have the ability to um, make sure that our members are covered. Two fields, quite frankly, isn't even enough. It only covers about 70% of our need, uh, but that's what we felt we could afford right now. And so that's why we've offered that, that amount at this time. Uh, we thought that this was also the best opportunity to partner with the community because you know, I know Derek had mentioned the $80,000 gap that you guys would be missing from, from not having us rent as much grass space. In fact, I think it's close to 11 fields, nine fields and then two turf fields, uh, so, which is a significant difference. Um, so from our perspective, we really felt like this was a no brainer that by partnering with us, it really gave the city four ways of recovering those costs. One is by renting turf time. So the additional turf time that's available could be rented and that could cover you know, part of that gap. The second was to create new programming. Is there things that the city could do uh, or Parks and Rec could do to create new programming that would create additional revenue? The third was to continue to rent the grass fields to other user groups. Uh, and the fourth would be cost savings. You know, if you don't need 11 fields, why maintain 11 fields? And is there some natural cost savings to that? So, um, you know, our preference is to find a way to partner with, with, with Parks and Recreation. We think it not only uh, suits our members, but obviously we'd love to retain our home, which, which we've been there for quite some time. Uh, and we really felt like after going through all of these conversations with, with our, own, uh, our own membership and our own board that this was really a opportunity for us to once again, invest into that complex and invest into our community uh, and to make sure that our members needs were taken care of at the same time. Um, so I don't know, I'm sure you've already had an opportunity to read through some of the benefits. I think there's multiple benefits that can be also addressed uh, by going through something like this. Uh, but uh, 
I think overall that that's what I would say about our, our position on the proposal. Okay. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, Parks and Recreation. Lauren, did you want to add any comments from Mammoth or anything about turf at all? <laughs> um, you're muted, Lauren. <laughs> Sorry about that. That always happens to me. I just had to take a toy away from my dog because it was squeaking it. But just wanted to kind of introduce Mammoth and say that, you know, we are a company that was founded um, on a lot of values and principles that align with the city of Lawrence. Um, we grew up, our company grew up in Meriden, Kansas, and um, you guys are our neighbors and we just want to do whatever we can to help. Yeah. Thank you, Lauren. Hey, Derek. Yeah. I forgot to mention a couple of things real quick that uh, Lauren just reminded me of seeing her there. You know, there's a couple other reasons that I, that I, I didn't want to mention that I didn't have uh, in the proposal. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons that we're trying to get this pushed through to November is one, there's a cost um, discount to doing it in off season time. So it's in between our seasons, which is super beneficial. It's during the down period of time for Mammoth, which means that we're actually knocking off another, I don't know, $100,000, $150,000 plus off the total project cost. Uh, so that doesn't affect our own programming. And obviously it helps reduce the price. Uh, obviously the need is now, we've needed this turf field for several years. Uh, but the other thing I think is to consider is that the price of turf isn't going down. And if we keep waiting, it's only going to get more expensive. Um, and the more expensive it gets, the harder it's going to be to find partners like us to help um, fund it. And or quite frankly, it's going to cost our community members more because they're going to have to pay more to, um, you know, to rent it hourly to, to help cover that gap. So I think there's a lot of benefits to doing this now. And uh, um, quite frankly, I know from our perspective, we're, we're uh, super uh, appreciative of, of Mammoth willing to hold <laughs> their pricing structure for us uh, um, through this uh, last several months. Eric, John Blazik, board member. I, I just have a couple questions. Um, hey, hey, John, can you, yes. can you hold off until uh, uh, Derek is ready? Uh, oh, until yeah. Thank you. Derek, if you'd like, I could pull the rendering up and kind of show everybody what we're talking about. Eric Rogers, Parks and Recreation. Sounds like a great idea, Mark. Are we seeing the rendering? Yep. All right. So just to give you a visual on what we're looking at, this is the youth sports complex with a little bit of, of artistic work. So right now there's five football fields, one, two, three, four, five. So this is a future ad. The two fields we're talking about are 14 and 15, which are right here. These are currently in place. The lights are currently in place. These are grass fields right now. The parking lot goes to about right there right now. So what we're proposing is turfing these two fields and then extending this parking lot to make this a little bit of a self-contained corner. These fields would also have cross fields on them. So U12 fields, there'd be four U12s, which is about the size of these grass fields here. So what this proposes is a future phase is potentially moving two of the football fields up to this corner, putting in a stadium type facility and maybe another turf field. That would be later on. Um, the 2026 proposal we have in has uh, artificial turf infields on these eight baseball diamonds, which again, improves playability. So what we know and what we've talked about with Sporting Cow Valley is they would utilize this area, but they'd also have some need to pick up some of the, the grass fields still on you know to run their full program because they like they like marcus said they can only run about 70 percent of their program on the artificial turf so we'd still be working with them a little bit on the grass fields and we know there's there's potential for baseball softball practices out on those grass fields if we did something with infields we think there's football practices that could take place out here uh, we think there's maybe other soccer groups that will want to rent space so anyway i just want to give you a visual on what we're talking about Derek Rogers, Director of Parks Recreation. Um, from anybody on the presenting side, is there anything else you would like to present or say before we turn it back to the board? 
Make just from Mammoth, I was going to just say that we appreciate the opportunity to work with the city and Sporting Caw Valley. Um, like I said earlier, just being so close to Lawrence and just about 30 minutes, I think west of, of the city of Lawrence, you know, a lot of our families come from that area and we'd just be a really proud partner to, to do anything with you guys. Thank you. Tanya, uh, you're muted, Tanya. Thank you. My name is Tanya Sieber. I serve on the Sporting Car Valley Board as well um, as Josh, who had to jump off earlier. Um, I, I sent um, a pretty exhaustive email to uh, your advisory board earlier, and I don't know that any of you have had a chance to read that. I know that'll be available to you after the meeting. Um, but while I had the opportunity in front of you, I just wanted to mention that in your um, 2017 Parks and Rec Master Plan, which Derek referenced earlier um, when he was talking about the strategic plan, your um, second goal as stated in the master plan is to prioritize the maintenance and or upgrading of existing facilities. I'm quoting your document here and be open to opportunities to build new amenities and facilities that meet the needs, standards, and expectations of the community. And one of the bullet pointed specified items um, under that goal is, it was called the Youth Sport Complex in 2017, we now call it the Clinton Lake uh, Youth, Youth Sport Complex. Um, but it specifically states to improve to tournament level fields. And there are several other improvements to that complex that are included in your master plan. But this is um, a stated goal of your department that's been in place, you know, going on five years now. And it is the desire of our organization to basically hand you by fully funding um, this checked box on your master plan. And um, it's extremely important to the sustainability of our operation. Um, we, we serve players ages three to 19 at all levels of competitiveness from three-year-old little sporties um, to the rec teams that I coach I coach little second and third graders, um, and I adore that. And they play on the grass, and they're ecstatic to do it. Um, but we also have um, a commitment and an obligation to our competitive players who are positioning themselves potentially to play in high school, to earn scholarships, to play in college. You know, many of them dream of being uh, semi-pro and professional players um, as a career as well. And the development of these turf surfaces for those players um, in particular is essential. And our ability as an organization to attract those competitive players and maintain them is diminishing year over year over year as clubs all around us from Manhattan, uh, to Topeka, to all over Kansas City, north and south of us, um, have the opportunity to play on uh, modern surfaces, right? Soccer, the game of soccer in 2021 is played on turf. And with the exception of our recreational program, where grass is definitely the pre preferred surface um, for the rest of our membership, this need is critical. And it's for that reason that we feel strongly enough about partnering financially to the tune of $1.6 million out of our coffers um, to make this a reality. And we really appreciate your um, advisory committee considering the benefits of this project. And we're here seeking your blessing to move forward um, this fall so that we can accomplish the strategic goal with the current pricing that Mammoth um, is generously uh, 
guaranteeing for us. So thank you, those are my comments. Graduate Director of Parks Recreation with that, I will turn it back to the advisory board. Thank you, Derek. Uh, and with that, uh, John, I know you've been itching to comment. Go for it. I'm paying, I'm paying attention now, buddy. You threw a curveball at me. Hey, I just want to just jump on board. And, and I, you know, I've been in athletics all my life as an athletic director and principal. This is a no-brainer, people. First of all, um, sporting Caw Valley in the northeast part of the state and all over Kansas is really well known well accepted uh, throughout the state in the soccer world. As a principal and AD, we need to remember, we've got to keep kids involved in activities. And it can be lots of activities, but if you want to know numbers, sporting, um, soccer is the number one sport for kids involved. It outnumbers football, basketball, baseball, softball, everything. And we can have that right here in Lawrence with the Call Valley, sporting Call Valley with us. Um, this is a no-brainer. Um, I, I know Mammoth Turf, they do a great job. I just think we need to look at this, people, because no maintenance, um, all weather. The only thing I would tell Marcus, I would go for maybe a, a roof over it and everything and even a little bit side so you can rent it all year long because that's the number one thing they're going on in communities, people. They're building these indoor complexes for soccer, basketball, like what we have out at Rock Chalk but they got four, five, six fields in there for kids. And this is this is a no brainer. My only question, Derek, and I don't know, maybe Marcus, uh, I know Mammoth Turf Field is great. If the city's paying for part of it, if I'm wrong, tell me guys, do we have to follow city bidding purposes just because everybody's wanting to sue the city anymore? Do we have to open that up or is it, how do you go about that, Derek? I don't know. I just want to make sure we do it right, but this is a no brain thing for our community and our kids and our city of Lawrence. Pass Can that somebody help me? To Mark on the contracting process. He knows that better than I do. <coughs> Mark Hecker, assistant director. What we're proposing here is using a cooperative purchasing agreement. So we use those, so that Greenbush Cooperative Purchasing is the recognized purchasing organization that we can purchase off of that contract. So it's been pre-bid. So that really speeds up the process a little bit in that we're, we know we're getting low prices because they've already been bid to government units. So that's what we'd be using on this one. And so we can bypass anything. Yeah, Green Bush is great in the bid and, you know, Mammoth with their price. That's a great price, guys. But uh, I just wanted to make sure somebody didn't come back and say, hey, why can't we bid on that if that's a city project? See where I'm coming from? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. We, we've used the purchasing procedure in the past. Again, this goes all the way to city commission for final approval. So that's what we are recommending. Good. That's all I want to say. It's, it's a no brainer for our community people and our kids. Nice job, Marcus and Lauren and Tanya. Okay. Can you hear me, but I said, and Derek and Mark. <laughs> Uh, any further comment? I would just, uh, Brendan Downey, Parks and Rec Advisory Board. I would just hop on with what John is saying. I agree completely. I think that uh, looking at the proposal and how things have been laid out for us, I, I have a hard time seeing how we couldn't jump on with SKV here. So um, yeah, I think that the city of Lawrence wins here and it would be really helpful in the future for a lot of things. So yeah, I just hop on. I agree with what John said and I'm, I'm excited to see this move forward, hopefully. Um, this is Marilyn Hall, board member. Um, also want to pile on the praise. This looks like um, a great and exciting proposal. And somebody who did a lot of driving to Kansas City when my kids were in sort of the elite level of athletics, I can tell you there's going to be a lot of Lawrence families that are really going to benefit from being able to keep their um, driving time down and their kids activities in town rather than being on the road all the time. I am a little curious, Derek, um, on 
the proposal included, it looked like it included $88,000 um, a year in new community use. And I guess I'm kind of curious, like, um, how, how did you come up with those numbers and um, what kinds of uses do you foresee and how likely are they? Eric Rogers, Director of Parks Recreation. The city of rent the new turf field, the other community user groups at a minimum of 600 hours at 80 bucks an hour, 48,000, is that the, the line you're looking at? Yeah, there were two lines. There was the 48,000 and then there was another 40,000. Yeah. That had to do with community use. And for Parks and Recreation, you know, that that's one of our, um, concerns is just the timing. I think, you know, I've talked to Marcus, I think our first year, if we push this forward, is an unknown. Um, who, the unknown of the department is, uh, what is the demand for artificial for turf outside of Sporting Call Valley? We know Sporting Call Valley, we use 2200 hours a year, $65. So how do we support it? You read the paper today, the there's other um, soccer organizations that will probably run other times. Um, and they'll free up grass times for these other organizations to rent space out at uh, youth sports. So there, there's an opportunity there. Um, we talked about the potential of lacrosse, rugby, uh, baseball field rentals. Uh, there may be some rec leagues, some things that we haven't explored. Um, for us, the, the immediate risk is we're going to have to adjust whether Sporting Call Valley um, moves forward with this project, or let's say Sporting Co. Valley said we're going to go build somewhere else, I would still have the same problem of coming up with the revenues of 80K to make up for that in my budget. Um, so, so, yeah, that, that first, first year is a little scary. Um, and even 2021 is really scary because I was hoping we'd be out of COVID and we're not, and my revenues are, are suffering because of it. Um, Mark, do you want to add anything on, on the hours and your thoughts? Sure, Mark Ecker, Assistant Director. So we, we stayed pretty conservative on our estimates. So if you look at Marcus's uh, write-up he did, there's, there's about 1,500 hours of turf time available, potentially. So we went, we went down to 600 and saying, you know, we don't know what the users are. We know there's an adult soccer group that would probably take some of those hours. We know there's some other, you know, even football may take some of those hours. So we stayed pretty low and hoping that that was low enough that we would cover. You know, we know Sporting Cal Valley may need some grass fields still. We know some of these other groups are maybe really interested in the grass fields. Honestly, we don't know about adult soccer, whether they rather play on the new turf or on the old grass. Either way, I think there's potential to use that out there. The, the rendering we put out showed a couple of multi-purpose fields up in that uh, Northwest corner. If we go in and convert those existing soccer to multi-purpose, we have a lot better capability to rent them for baseball, softball practices. So, you know, it, it, a little bit is going to be creativity in, in programming. And then are there programs that we can run that we don't currently run because we don't have space? So the, my biggest concern on this whole thing is that 80,000, is how do we recoup that? Because I know we'll put, we'll, between Sporting Cow Valley payments, we'll cover the debt payment for the new turf. It's how do we cover the 80,000 that's in our budget is probably our biggest concern. Mark, John Blazik, advisory board member. You know, once that word gets out and you know, with that, those two fields, I'm telling you what, I bet you you'll make more than you think you will. Cause once that word gets out, the number of teams that want to use turf fields is unbelievable. That's the number one thing going. I just heard Derek talk about a stadium with a turf or something down the road out there. People, that, that's what people are wanting nowadays, not just for soccer, for everything. I bet you, you can rent that more than you'll think and within a year window. Once it's advertised, that's going to be done in Lawrence. All the number of schools that don't have turf fields, when weather comes in, inclement weather. Now, the Lawrence schools are lucky to have good facilities, people. But you take all the surrounding ones and advertise to them. I'll tell you what, that rental field will go more than I bet you, you do. But I think you've done a great job on your numbers, Mark. You seem to do that really well with only going, you know, a certain percentage. But I just see this being a great thing for Lawrence and 
rental out. For, I bet you'll make some money off that. Just with my knowledge of the turf stuff and fields. Now, I want to chime in a couple of things too. I mean, this doesn't include any new programming that we may have. Um, and I know, you know, when we have opportunities in the summer, we may want to do more during the week. We may look at new tournaments. Um, you know, so there are some new things that we haven't really considered either. The other thing that, that I wanted to say is uh, we're not opposed to looking and helping, you know, with a third field coming, you know, 2024, 2026 either. So I think that, you know, I, I think John is right. I think it was John, right? Uh, you know, I think sometimes the need is understated and I, I can certainly understand Mark uh, being cautious, especially this first year. But in my experience in working with a lot of other executive directors and a lot of other organizations that now are having very large complexes, 10, 12, you know, 15 turf fields, I, I can't, they want more. That's why they keep building these giant complexes in Kansas City. So uh, I, think, I think if you look at some of the numbers, this may be a revenue generator for you in two or three years, not something that's really, uh, that, that you're working, you're thinking about losing money on. So, uh, Bart Little John, Park, Park and Rick Advisory Board Chair. Uh, th it's, it's, I agree with everyone. This sounds like a great proposal and it looks great. The only thing that I'm a little bit hesitant on is the, the speed of it. And then also, um, given what we've just been discussing, our previous agenda item re regarding idea um, and uh, what, you know, um, Jackie uh, gave us the great suggestion for is I want to make sure that we're not missing out on anybody or leaving anybody behind. So uh, that would be the only thing that I would caution us on is I want to make all of the programs that come out of Parks and Rec or association with Park and Rec as inclusive and, uh, and as equitable as possible. So. This is uh, John Albandian, board member. Um, what is what are, what is uh, the advisory board being asked to do now? I'm Derek Rogers, director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, basically, what we were looking for: recommend, vote on, um, sending the proposal forward to the city commission which is gonna require changing the 2026 CIP item, which would have to be done by the city commission as part of the, and make this project part of the 2022 CIP funding this year of the project. Okay, this is John Albandian board member. I will move that we do that. Okay, there is a motion out there to go ahead and use it to the city. Uh, John Nelbanian with the motion. Is there a second out there? John Blazik, board member, will second. All right, there is a second out there, and I will just do the uh, hand vote as before. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand of moving it to the city commission for uh, deliberation. And now uh, for the opposition, all those opposed? Okay. It, uh, it is me being moved to the city for deliberation. So um, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't, I don't hope your hopes weren't up. We are not the, uh, the wouldn't be the decider of this thing. Uh, that is a lot of money. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'd, if I'd want to write that check. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm glad that the uh, city commission will, will have uh, the opportunity to go ahead and look after it. Yeah. It's, uh, but, uh, Thank you for putting that forward uh, uh, to us. And uh, it, as everybody said, I mean, I think it'll it'll be a great benefit to the community. And uh, we just have to make sure that uh, we can, you know, look at all the parameters of it. And uh, hopefully the city will be able to go ahead and look at it and deliberate. So um, does anybody have any, uh, any further comment on this? I'm Derek Rogers, Director of Parks and Recreation. I just want to let you know to go to the City Commission. We have a placeholder for next week. So we'll try to get it there and see what we can do. Okay. Uh, yeah, 
thank you guys for the proposal. It was very detailed. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. This is John Blazik. Derek, do I need, let me ask you, do we need to have anybody? Because if we need somebody from the advisory board to go to the city commission, and I would, I would be happy to talk about the importance of this facility, just with my educational background and number of kids that this would involve. Do we need anybody there? The Derek Rogers, Redford Parks Recreation. I'd say it never hurts on any um, on any uh, agenda item, and with Zoom, it's really easy to be there and not have to go in person. What day is that, Derek? Tuesday, September twenty first, I believe. I don't have my calendar up in front of me. I'm pretty sure that's the day. Five thirty. Um, yes. If somebody would send me a Zoom, I would be happy to. Unless somebody else, wants, if Bart wants to do it, or Brandon wants to do it, or Valerie wants to do it, Val, <laughs> somebody else, but I'd be happy to offer to be on that Zoom call for these people. Uh, yeah, I, I think any one of us do it, John. It's just that we wouldn't be speaking for the board when we do it. We'd be speaking uh, for ourselves. So, um, but any one of us can do it. Okay. So, that's the only thing. This is Marilyn Hull, board member. I think actually if the board voted, we could have a representative speak on our behalf. We did, we've done that before. Oh, okay. Yes, that is correct, Marilyn. Roger Steinbrock, marketing supervisor. And usually it's the either the chair or the vice chair that have done that. But if they can't, then some other board member could do that as well. But it's up to you as a board deciding who speaks for the board. Is that something that you guys would like to pursue uh, as per as per John? Can we also, if he wasn't elected by you all, have him speak on our behalf? Uh, <laughs> So, Derek, I'm, I'm not sure on, on that, on that part. Um, this is John Nalbandian. As a former commissioner and mayor, uh, I think it, if, if it looks like the commission is going to be in favor of this without a lot of debate, having a whole lot of people endorse it is kind of boring. So if, but if it's going to be controversial, then I think a show from the advisory board, uh, a, a, you know, a heavy show from the advisory board and from the residents would be important. Derek, do you have any sense of whether this is controversial? Derek Rogers, Director of Parks and Recreation. I I think it would be wise to have a representative from the board there. It could be if you look at our budgets. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that was mentioned was, are we prioritizing um, one user group over another user group? Uh, we're looking at a $20 million shortfall in 2024. Um, our, and from a, speaking from a Parks and Rec advisory board or a Parks and Rec department, yeah, I, I look at our revenues, we're still in 2021 revenues are or tanking and who knows where we'll be in 2022. Um, so budgets from my perspective will continue to be something that I will continue to work on and worry about until we can make it through the next few years. It may or may not be controversial. The CIP committee again um, took a neutrality stance and said this truly is a city commission decision if they want to reprioritize the CIP, a budget they just approved. So I think on that aspect, it could be a little controversial. Mark, do you have anything to add or you think I'm spot on or am I missing it? No, I think you're accurate. I think the biggest conversation will be the change of the CIP. I think most everyone who's listened to the proposal agrees it's a good idea. It's just a matter of prioritizing it up against other city initiatives. Sorry, Mark Hecker, Assistant Director of Parks and Rec. 
This is John, now Bandian board member. Do you have any sense of whether the finance director and, and the city manager are going to endorse this? Eric Rogers, director of Parks and Recreation. The city manager and Jeremy Wilmoth, the finance director, have been involved, and we all agree that this is a great opportunity and turf for our community members would be a great thing. And so we've all been supportive of the initiative. So I then, then I think it, it's it would be very important for the finance director to speak to this, to speak to this issue. Uh, Derek, did, did you know if he would have the opportunity to weigh in during that? Or? Derek Rogers, Director of Parks and Recreation, they, there's no doubt in my mind that Jeremy will probably weigh in and uh, the city manager will probably weigh in. I, I see this as a, a level of project and, and touching the CIP process that there'll be a lot of weigh in on it, just on that alone. This is Marilyn Hall, board member. Well, it seems to me that that might be the, the most credible voice. If, if the only thing controversial about this is, you know, city finance related, and we as an advisory board aren't really experts in that, and in fact, aren't really called upon explicitly to approve any budget items or things like that, it seems like, um, having the finance director endorse it might carry more weight with the city commissioners uh, than our endorsement. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I apologize. I got some stuff going on here, Derek. Um, what, what, what meeting would that be scheduled for again? Just for just my own edification. Uh, Tuesday, September 21st. Okay. Mark, John Blazik, advisory board member. What, uh, John, what Marilyn just said, being a past commissioner and mayor, I, it, it, what Marilyn says is pretty strong, isn't it, from the finance person? Uh, yeah, that's that's what I'm getting. That's the sense I'm getting from Derek and, you know, John Nalbandian and, and okay. uh, Marilyn is – or Maryland is that uh, if the finance it he's since it's going to be it since it's going to take an adjustment of the CIP that is currently scheduled from five for five years now from now for this project and moving it up what he says I think is probably the heavy hand in this conversation. This is John Albandian again. So our role with the city commission should be to endorse the proposal. And then it's up to the finance director and the city manager and, and uh, Derek to advocate beyond that in terms of like Marilyn saying, can we do it? So our, our role is to say, should we do it? And I think then it's the staff's responsibility to say, can we do it? I would agree, John. Uh, it seems like from all of us commenting on this and nobody really has any, you know, problems with the proposal itself. It's just making sure that one, the timing fits and two, uh, other things around it fit in terms of making sure that it fits with our strategic plan. So, um, so and, that's, and that's a higher level discussion for the city commission as you were, as you were, you were addressing as well. So I think you're correct. Derek Rogers, Director of Parks and Recreation from the City CIP Committee position. They took the neutrality position of no opinion just based on the timing because they do have the project in the CIP, which was approved for 2026. So I, I think that truly is where it belongs at the commission level for the decision, just like we thought it was uh, definitely worth bringing to the advisory board before going to the commission. Okay, well, Derek, I think 
did we give you a formal endorsement to move it on? I thought we did. Didn't we vote on it? And Derek Roger, Park Recreation. I'm seeing Roger, so I know I've crossed the T's and dotted the I's. You voted okay. On <laughs> okay. I just wanted to make sure that we talked about it, but didn't actually do it. Okay. Okay. Roger Steinbrock, marketing supervisor. Yes, I think you covered it. And I will add that to the agenda item and uh, also get that posted post haste. All right. Okay. Cool. All right. So, well, thank you guys again for the uh, submitting the proposal. Like I said, it was very detailed and uh, you guys put a lot of, it was very well thought out. So um, you, you've given, get, given a lot of, uh, a lot of information for the city, uh, city commission to go ahead and deliver it. From. So uh, thank you guys for, for doing that. Um, if anybody, if no one else has any further comment, I would go ahead and move us on in the, uh, in the agenda here. Did you have something to say, Marcus? Or oh, okay. no, it's kind of a thank you for having oh. me. <laughs> okay. Good thing, okay. guys. <laughs> thank you so much. Gotcha. All right. Not a problem. All right. I, I know no one can see me. I'm actually outside, but I am here still. It's uh, This is the only safe place with a two and a half year old around. So, all right. This is where I'm going to be. Um, okay. Bart, real quick, Roger Steinbrock, marketing supervisor. Brendan had to jump off the call just to let you know he had a, another engagement at 730. Gotcha. Thank you for letting me know, Roger. All right. Uh, looks like we're at concerns of the board and mem and items of interest. Um, does anyone have any? And of course, as I said before, you can go ahead and address uh, some of the general comment items as well that were brought up. So I will open it up to the this board. This is uh, John Nelbandi, and I think we ought to talk about the, the bike trails and the water. Derek, um, what... I know you guys have been dealing with this probably for years. Um, what what can be done? Little bridges, what? Uh, Derek Rogers, Director of Parks and Recreation. I'm going to pass the mark. He's done quite a bit over his 20 year career on, on dealing with this. And yeah, I have the same issues, not only on some of our trails, but also on city sidewalks and other places that I've had my share of accidents too. So Mark. Yeah, Mark Hecker, System Director of Parks and Rec. Uh, the Rock Shock Park Trail in particular, we are doing a drainage project on that, which actually just started today. So on that, we'll cut the uphill side, uh, cut a couple places through the trail and put drain tiles in to try to collect water. Now, just to be upfront, we really haven't had complaints on that trail section. So when the person that talked tonight talked about that, there have been multiple wrecks. That really hadn't been something with, that had been reported to us. And I had talked to him oh, a couple months ago. So, you know, as we know about these issues, we try to address them. Some are easier to address than others. Uh, the one out through the, the emergency spillway at the lake, really there's not a whole lot we can do. We've raised some of those trail sections, tried to get water underneath, but you know, if we get a four or five inch rain, the water's just gonna be there. And that's, we've gotten to the point where we actually close that trail if we see it's gonna be a problem. The slime they talked about is honestly a weather item. So in other words, it has to be rainy and then turn really hot, which creates that kind of black mossy stuff on the pass. You know, if it's 95% of the time it rains in the spring and the water goes across, it's not a problem. It's usually midsummer when we get the big, biggest slick spots. So um, again, we address them as we know about them and try to do our best. There's a lot of trails around. This is John Nelbandian, board member again. Uh, the bike trail uh, at Louisiana Street, you know, when it rains there, you know, it's like, it's almost like really unpassable. It would really be helpful if, like at Iowa Street, there could be some sort of, not at Iowa Street, I mean at, uh, what is that, Michigan Street, whatever that, up at the top of the hill where the Baker Wetlands 
office is, you know, up there where you go downhill uh, then to the uh, Louisiana. If there could be something, a temporary sign there that says, you know, this is it's unpassable at Louisiana Street so that we don't end up riding our bikes down there and having to ride back. Yeah, Mark Eckers, I, I think we, we try to address those type of situations. The problem is they change so quickly. So if we have that little quick three inch rain thing, they flood out and then, you know, within a half hour, they're back to open again. Oh, we do the best we can, but people get mad at us either way. If we have it closed and it's passable, then they get upset. Yeah, right. So yeah, I, it's, it's an ongoing problem especially when you get these big rains that we've been getting, it seems like this last year and a half where, you know, it'll just dump two inches at a time. Derek Rogers, director for Parks Recreation. I just going to say, John, sometimes when we, that stretch of the Baker Wetlands Trail, some of it's county, some of it's city, and um, I, I need to check the map again. I know exactly what you're talking about because there's times I, I probably shouldn't bike through it, but I have fish swimming through my spokes. Um, just because I want to get through. But yeah, you're, you're right. That is an area that we need to keep an eye on and signage would help. Um, this is Pat Phillips, board member. Um, I'm an avid biker that also has gone through that water area. And I know that, you know, that that's been an ongoing problem. And I know it could be costly, but in the future, could there ever be a thought of doing a bridge over? Do not even deal with that wetland. Um, because, you know, it's built on water. Um, so just a thought, and I know it's a costly one. We're just trying to get the loop attached, but maybe down the line, that could be a grant that possibly we get to have a bridge to go over. And Jackie Becker, if, if not a bridge, which is a way better idea than what I'm going to recommend. Uh, I was curious if um, we have any cameras out there. So is there a way that if we had video on that area that, both the area by Haskell, and then when you're coming down from uh, the west side, there could be some kind of light that goes off. So when you're on your bike, you see the light go off at those corners, you kind of know not to turn and keep going because you can't get through. Again, I don't know how costly that would be either, but just another suggestion. I like that. This is Marilyn Hull, board member. Um, and this kind of goes over what everybody's specific comments are, and that is with the loop getting more and more connected and groups like Friends of Lawrence Area Trails promoting it, um, it, it I think it's gonna need more active management. Um, and I don't know what that looks like on the staff side, but I think it's gonna be more than, you know, sort of waiting for complaints. There's gonna have to be, and yeah, I know you do some of that already, but there may have to be even more of that of just, um, monitoring that trail and making sure that users know what, what's safe, what's not safe. I, uh, Mr. Knight, you know, it's, it's a little bit interesting when he talks about it because he says, I could sue you and it'd be open and shut case, but I'm not gonna sue you. It's, it's sort of like this slightly veiled threat. And I don't think that's a way we really um, want to interface with public and the users of the trail. So being super proactive, finding a way to communicate, working with partner groups like Friends of Lawrence Area Trails to get out information. Um, I happen to know that group probably has 1500 Facebook followers. Um, so if, the, if you know that there are gonna be problems, partnering with a group like that to help get that information out to people who use the trail regularly I think that would all be all be great. Uh, I would like to piggyback on that. Marilyn said, "Is there like any sort of active monitoring system that you guys have for the trails, or have anything planned for the trails? Just to, in terms of something that can clue you into like upkeep or anything like that?" I see Darren's head nodding. So he knows something I don't. You want to... <laughs> or is that just? I think it's a great idea. Mark, Mark. <laughs> Mark Ecker, assistant director. So our, our most active monitoring is our mowing. So as we mow the trails, we'll see a lot of things. We have trees down, we have leaves on the trails, we have water over trails. So 
that's happening on a weekly basis. I would say our, we see most of the trails weekly and that we have to be out there for some type of maintenance activity. So, you know, it's not like we just don't worry about them. I, I feel like we see a lot of the stuff, honestly, the, the things that catch us off guard are the storms. If we have a storm blow in in the evening, you know, we'll get complaints by that next morning that, hey, there's a, there's a tree down or there's leaves all over this trail or there's water on this trail. So by the time we have a chance to respond to it, we already have four complaints on it. So, yeah, I, I feel fairly confident that we're seeing, you know, all 75 miles of trails we have. So, uh, of course, there's always more that can be done, you know, but I, I'm not seeing that as our biggest deficiency in park maintenance, I guess. Roger Steinbrock, marketing supervisor. Um, I'm always looking at it from the communication standpoint at those spots that we know that are troublesome, um, putting up signage, caution, slow down, you know, um, some some kind of warning ahead of those, those spots because there are some that I think we know that are problematic. Is that something that, that we could entertain to do possibly? Yeah, Mark Hecker, assistant director. Most of the spots that we know about are already marked. So Rock Chalk Park Trail had signage going up the day after we talked about this problem. The, the one through the spillway all have, have signs up. Unfortunately, people don't usually read the signs, so just kind of blow past them. So if we know it's slick, especially out in the spillway, we'll actually close the trail and until the, we can get to where there is no slime across the trail. So it's 